everyone, welcome back to another stream. And this time, uh, it, it, it's finally time that I, uh, you know, kept my word and actually do a stream on my setup. So this being both, you know, the software that I use, but also the hardware that I have set up around my desk, both for streaming, but also just, you know, generally for work. Um, I figure I'd start with the hardware because the hardware is the the bits that require the most arrangement to kind of work. Uh, as hopefully you'll see in a problem, everything works fine when you try to use your phone as a web camera. Um, and if it didn't work fine, then maybe I'll edit it out. We'll see. Um, before I start, there are a couple of things I want to get out of the way. So let me go here and switch over to uh, this thing. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Like so. So I have finally been able to open a GitHub sponsors. Uh, this was something that I couldn't do while I was in the US for various visa reasons. Um, and so now that I'm no longer in the US and no longer under the same um, uh, under the same restrictions, I've been able to open uh, GitHub sponsors. Um, I also have a Patreon uh, that I can show you right here. Uh, and this Patreon, the, the, the information that's on the Patreon and the information that's on the GitHub sponsors is about the same. Um, there are a couple of different tiers. I don't want to sort of go through all the details, but the basic idea here is that if you feel like you have derived value from some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the content that I've put out there, whether that's videos, whether that's talks, whether that's the, the book, uh, or, you know, open source projects, then this is one way in which you could sort of uh, give back basically to make it possible for me to spend more time on it going forward. Um, or just in general, if you want to say thank you, um, there's sort of everything from a relatively small tier to a much larger tier. Um, I want to be clear here though, that this is not something that I sort of rely on for, you know, life. Um, I'm doing okay. I have a stable job, but you don't need to sponsor me. Uh, and certainly if you're a student, I don't want you to sponsor me. Um, but if you feel like you want to sort of say a, a thank you, then this is one way in which you can do so. Um, if you do, you also get access to um, my new Discord server, which is right here. You can get to it if you go to uh, discord.johnhu.eu. It'll take you to this um, this doorstep channel that explains basically the same things that were in the GitHub sponsors and the, the Patreon. Um, and these other channels you basically get access to uh, at, depending on the tier that you sponsor at. None of it is like, super crucial. Uh, none of it is going to like change your life. Um, this is not intended to be a sort of get sponsors where I produce lots of private content and you only get access to it if you sponsor. I don't want it to be that way. Um, I want to keep producing sort of open educational content. Uh, and that makes it a little weird to have something like a Patreon, right? Because normally you're sort of incentivized to only, um, give people things if they pay you. And I kind of want to do it the other way around where you pay me so that I can give away things for free to more people. Um, uh, the main thing that you'll see on here that is sort of uh, available to everyone is there's announcements channel where I announce things like the stream and all future streams. So if you don't want to follow me on, you know, various social medias because you don't want to be on those sites or you just, just remove that from your life, uh, then maybe you could join the, only this one Discord server uh, and you can get your announcements from there. That's entirely up to you. Um, apart from that, uh, the other quick thing I wanted to share is um, I'm going to be at Rust Nation in the UK. So the, the Rust conference that's held in London in the end of March. Um, there's some pretty exciting stuff happening there that I can't talk about yet, um, but I'm very excited to go. So if you uh, are not going, then maybe consider going. And if you are going, then say hi to me there because we'll have a lot of fun. Um, okay, with those things out of the way, let's then go to hardware setup. Yeah, I know I use Discord light mode. I use light mode for things. I actually like light mode. Um, let's start out with uh, physical setup stuff. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna see if I can get my phone to act as a web camera. And in theory, my phone can do this. In practice, it's a, uh, you know, a little bit hit or, hit or miss uh, whether that works. We will find out. So now, uh -huh, if I now do this, let's see if it works. Boom, 
Do you now, in theory, see my screen? I'm going to share my full screen at some point so you can see the the actual things on the on the screen better later on. It frozen? Oh no. Oh no. You see Windows. All right, let's try this again. Let's see if I can get it to work the next time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. No data transfer. Back to webcam. How about now? Still the same, still the same, still no. Still the same. You still don't see my monitor. All right, then I will have to go into OBS and get OBS to be helpful here. If I do this. Oh, that's because OBS got very confused. How about that? Now maybe you can see it. Oh, and then it, oh boy, oh boy. It worked for a second and then it stopped. See, this is what I get for getting excited about a new technology and seeing if I can work it work. Yeah, I know. It's uh it's very concerning that it's uh not really doing its thing. Okay. This is now still working. So I'm going to I'm going to keep OBS open so I can monitor whether it freezes. So there are a couple of things that I'll I'll show you around my desk here. Oh, and it froze again. All right. Clearly, maybe it's the cable. I don't know. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab a different webcam. Let's see here. Give me a second. I'll be back with another webcam. I'm gonna call that a great success. Let's see now with an actual camera. Or rather an actual webcam. Let's see what we can do here. Uh-huh. And then I wanna do studio mode. And then I wanna do phone cam. Aha. So stop studio mode, and now switch to this one. Aha! Okay, we now have a webcam on a stick instead. Excellent. And this one seems like it's just kind of working. So let's pretend none of that happened, and uh, well, we'll try again. All right, I'm very glad I had a webcam just sort of lying around. That was uh, by by sheer luck. Okay. So um, the first thing you, you may notice is that I only have one screen. There's no, there's no second monitor. No, there's the laptop over there, but there's no actual second monitor. And for my home, this is my work computer. So my home computer has only a single screen. Um, this is something that was a big debate for me about whether I wanted to go the, the dual screen route. Uh, I decided not to because I kind of find it annoying to navigate windows across multiple screens. And I can just use virtual desktops for it and it works just as well for me. Um, the other thing that I'll show you is I have my rubber duck. So my rubber duck here is the uh, my debugging companion. So whenever I run into programming problems, I talk to my rubber duck. And then I have a split keyboard. This is the Kinesis gaming keyboard. Um, I've used this for years and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and then I have one of these Kensington like ergonomic mice and so this is one where you use your whole like hand your your fingers to actually move the thing around um, And so it's not one of those thumb ones is a full arm one. Uh, I find that this helps enormously with like RSI um, I've been very very happy that with that um, 
I have speakers. I don't think they're particularly, you know, interesting or important. And then I have these, uh, these little lights that I use for streaming. And then behind here, you'll see I have a bunch of mess of wires. And then I have a stand. I'm thinking of upgrading the stand because it's a little wonky. And then I have an actual like DSLR with a prime lens up here that I use as a webcam. Uh, I've been really happy with this one. It gives pretty crisp video quality compared to, you know, the webcam I'm currently holding, which uh, can't even render this nicely. Um, and then I have my drawing pad. So this one is basically like a full US paper size. Um, I use this for, you know, annotations of papers and the like, but I mostly use it for streams, for drawing diagrams. It's really handy to try to do that rather than trying to do it with a, with a mouse. Um, and then, you know, work laptop, not super interesting. But what is kind of interesting is that the home desktop and the laptop are both connected to the same screen. And I'm going to, I don't know if this is going to be useful at all. But if you look at the back here, no, I'm not going to show that. It's not going to make any sense. But basically, I have a USB hub and a bunch of, like, basically all my peripherals, including my little sound device here, those are all connected to the screen. And then the screen has a built-in KVM switch. And so I can switch between my work computer and my home computer um, through like a single button on the monitor. And then everything switches over. So that includes sound, that includes my webcam, that includes my keyboard, my mouse, um, like literally just everything switches over between one computer and the other, um, which is very, very handy. It makes it pretty easy to just have a single setup. Um, and like even, you know, during the workday or, you know, while I'm just on my home computer, I can really quickly switch to the other one just to, uh, just to get things working. Um, apart from that, I have my little corner over here at fidget things. You got to have things to fidget with and my headphones, which I did a stream once wearing headphones. I'm not entirely sure why I did that. There's no actual sound coming from here. My cable management is awful. Um, I have a lot of cables. It's actually like not quite as bad as you think. Like they are like pulled together, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a mess. And believe it or not, I am actually using Wi-Fi. Like my, my desktop here and the thing I'm streaming over is using this Wi-Fi antenna on top of my box here. Oh man, this camera is so bad. I wonder if I can, eh, not easily, uh, but it is actually all Wi-Fi based uh, and it, it's working pretty well. The Wi-Fi is just past that door over here behind this giant sound blanket uh, and actually get pretty good reception. And then over here, I have a little, this is my thinking chair. So I go sit over here next to the fake plant. I wish it could be real, but with cats, that's harder. Um, and so this is where I sit and think whenever I get stuck on things. Still haven't uh, put that picture up, but I want, I don't know if you can see this picture particularly well, but it's a guy sitting with his head in a plant. And so I want that to be in the plant. Uh, I like this piece of artwork too. It's, uh, it's got like a thousand faces on them and one of the faces, or it's like got like a thousand heads and one of the heads has no face and you need to try to figure out which one it is. Um, and then apart from that, you know, I have, I like maps. So I have maps up here. Um, this in particular is a D and D map of the sword coast of the forgotten realms, because of course you got to have that. Uh, and you know, printer and box and stuff, my board game collection, which I really want to organize better, but alas, this is where Chai sleeps right there. Um, and then my wooden DM screen that my players gave to me a few years ago, which I love very much. Um, I got a, I got a little embedded device. And my plan is to start trying to fiddle with it and see if I can build something interesting, maybe on stream, but I haven't gotten there yet. Um, and then down here, I have my three copies of Blood on the Clock Tower. That one to the right is like a playtest prototype that I'm very happy with. That's another conference I'm going to soon or a convention is the Clock Tower Con in April in Washington, DC. I'm very excited. I'm going to be playing Clock Tower basically continuously for three days. Yeah, the, these three. And uh, blood on the Clock Tower. Um, I think that's most of the hardware setup, really. I do have like an audio switch and stuff. Um, that's mostly because my microphone, this guy right here, um, is like a Rode Procaster. So it only has XLR. And so this is the thing that I use to then switch into the computer. Um, Oh yeah, I'm very happy with my rug. This one here. 
took me forever to find one that I actually liked. And then I have a little cat cave here where sadly the cats do not particularly like this cave, but it's right here. So I'm just hoping that one day they'll, uh, they'll accept that this is the best place to be in the house. Okay, I think that's all the hardware stuff, unless people have questions about hardware that I can try to answer while I still have this camera connected. Uh, this is a 4K monitor, so it's, uh, you know, 3160 by 2156 or something. Um, the PC specs, yes, so that, but that I can do without having to hold this. I'm just trying to figure out if there are other, other things that I want to show as opposed to, like, give you the specs for. Uh, do you customize the buttons on the trackball? Yeah, so I have... Um, these two buttons map to previous virtual desktop and next virtual desktop so that it's really fast for me to switch back and forth between them. Um, that's sort of the main one. Oh, the chair, of course, the chair. I have spent so long trying to find a good chair. The one I've landed on is this thing. It's a really weird chair. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. Um, it is like a, an ergonomic chair and it's actually, um, a uh, Norwegian brand called Hog that have developed this like weird ergonomic chair called, uh, it's called a Capisco chair. Um, and it's really nice when you sit for long periods of time because it is um, designed so that you, um, it's designed, actually, let me switch back to that. Um, so this chair is designed so that it forces you to sit more upright um, it forces you to sit with your legs somewhat spread uh, as opposed to like uh, like bundling them together or tightening them. Um, it forces you to have your lower back sort of aligned. Um, it's a it's a chair that is not super comfortable, but it is very good for you. Um, I looked at many of the Herman Miller chairs, for example, and I, I tried them out and they are very comfortable, but comfort is not really what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is something where I'm not going to regret using this chair, you know, 20 years from now. Um, this or my previous steel case chair, uh, I, you know, I think this one, the steel case chair was definitely more comfortable than this one. Like this one, I can't, I can't like lean back easily. Um, but the downside of the steel case chair is that I could sort of slump in it and I can't do that in this chair. Like it just will not let me, um, this was, it forces me to, to sit a lot better. Uh, the orange thing, the one close to the mic. Uh, orange thing close to the mic. You mean the drawing pad? What do you mean this one? This thing is a remote for my lights. Oh, Capisco, uh, C-A-P-I-S-C-O. Uh, and it's Hog, H, uh, A with a ring above it, G. Um, are the lights easy on your eyes? These are new. So I'm still getting used to them. The trick with them is actually to align them so that when I look at the camera, they're not, they're sort of in the periphery of my vision, but not directly on me. The orange pad. Do you mean the Ferris over there? Do you mean, I mean, this one is just a drawing tablet. The coolest D&D &D hardware I have. Well, I recently got a initiative tracker that, that attaches to the top of a DM screen. But apart from that, I mean, I have this thing. This is, this is a, you know, everyone has something that they probably shouldn't have spent money on, but they did. And for me, that was getting basically all of the cards. So these are like handout cards for players for every spell, every action, every class feature, every monster. Uh, like here, like all of the monsters. Um, and the reason I got this whole thing is because I really prefer playing D&D &D without screens when I can. Um, and this helps my players not have to have screens in front of them because they can track everything with, um, uh, they can track everything with cards instead. So this one I'm pretty happy with. Okay, um, as far as my computer setup goes, oh, uh, one more thing. So um, for my camera, the actual way the setup goes is the 
um, the camera goes into an HDMI splitter. Um, one side of it goes to like a PyLink card. That's a PCI card in my in my desktop. The other one goes to an Elgato cam link. So it's a USB thing that goes into the Mac. Uh, and so I do have to, technically I have to press the second button in order to switch my webcam between uh, work and home. Um, Oh, the we are all living in America part. That's a, it's basically a bug in the newest version of Hyperland where um, they changed the default for whether these weird little quotes um, get auto displayed or not. And because I haven't specifically configured them to off, when I updated, suddenly, you know, they started showing. Um, apparently it's been fixed in the newest version, so the default's been changed again. Um, Got a personal laptop? I do. I don't have it in here. Um, I've actually been using the same uh, model of laptop for a very long time. I've been using the Lenovo X1 Carbon series. Um, they're, I've been extremely happy with them. I think I've had three different generations now. Like my first one was literally the first generation of the X1 Carbon. And then I have the third generation and now I have the sixth generation. Um, I think now they're on like generation 13 or something. And I just haven't really needed a new one for a while. Um, I think my next laptop is probably going to be from Framework. Um, so that's the one where you can, um, they're sort of built to be repairable and modularizable. Um, but I'm really holding out for them to get an ARM processor. And whether they will in any meaningful amount of time is unclear. Um, oh, there's one last thing I haven't shown, which is my little stream deck. So this... Lots of people get, you know, these fancy things for controlling. Oh, this webcam is so bad. Um, for controlling which, like, scene to show in OBS. I have a numpad. And then I just have these different buttons mapped to different things. So this button will take me to sharing my code view. This one will do my webcam. This will do the current shitty cam I'm holding. This will mute my sound. So I have, like, the buttons just mapped straight on there. Who needs a deck, right? So I can just do this, and it's back to me. It's very handy. It's very straightforward. Uh, it was dirt cheap, too. You know, the Steam Deck is, like, in an insane amount of money, and a numpad little thing. It's, like, plastic. It costs nothing. Um, I even brought it with me from the U.S. because I didn't want to buy a new one. I'm very happy with this, like, this dinky thing I found. Um... In terms of my desktop, um, like computer hardware, I have, um, it's an AMD Ryzen CPU. It's the, I want to say that it is the, actually I can find this out pretty easily just so to make sure I don't lie to you. Um, I have, uh, this one. Uh, nope, that's the wrong component. I have a Lian Li um, case. It's the O11 Air Mini that I'm pretty happy with. Um, and then I have, I've installed water cooling in it, so it's basically completely quiet. Like, if I don't speak and the microphone is on, um, the only sound you can hear is the sound of the fan in the uh, in the audio interface that I use. Uh, and I used to have a spinning disk in my computer, and you can hear that if it spins up. Um, then I have the uh, Gigabyte B650 uh, motherboard. And I have the... Here, let me pull that up. And then I have an AMD Ryzen... Um, why is it not? Uh, it's the Ryzen 9 7950X3D. Um, it took me ages to figure out exactly which one I wanted and whether I wanted the 3D one or not. Um, I found this to be, it's like a 16 core 32 hyper thread kind of CPU um, that just, it works really well. I find that it compiles things super quickly. The hyper threads work decently well. Um, I also think the extra um, cache size you get from the 3D does help with Rust compilation, but it is it is pretty marginal, like, realistically. Um, and then I have uh, I have an AMD um, a GPU as well, just because the NVIDIA drivers on Linux are so annoying. So it's like a, it's an RX 7900 XT, uh, which I'm pretty happy with. 
Um, and apart from that, you know, I have I have like an NVMe drive. It's like a terabyte uh, Kingston Fury Renegade um, that I've also been very happy with. Um, and I think that's like most of the hardware setup of relevance. Um, I do have a um, a NAS that I use for backups of, in particular, the the recordings of my videos. Um, that one is just like over by the router so that I don't need to deal with it here. Um, and then I think that's most of the sort of actual computer hardware setup. Uh, I don't do ML, no. You can tell that from my graphics card. Um, I, I do a little bit. Like I do have a sort of... I ran a little bit of stable diffusion on my computer and stuff and it worked okay. Um, but like, clearly this is not, not what you're intended to use if you do it for real. Um, and that's okay. I don't, I don't mind that too much. Um, I don't use any kind of OBS noise suppression. Um, I have my, this is one of the reasons why the, the mic is on an arm, um, is because I can get it very close to my mouth and then I can turn the gain down quite a fair bit. Um, and so I'm, the, it's very hard for it to capture any noise at this point because the gain is so low. Um, let's see. Um, what's the extra mouse for? Oh yeah, I have a, I have a Razer mouse in there that I use just for if I'm going to play any kind of FPS or something. I have a mouse mat and I, I sort of pull that, that mouse forward because it's, you don't really want to play that with like a trackball mouse. It does not work very well. Um, not really worth it. Uh, do you have any stickers on your stuff? No, I don't really, I'm not really a stickers person. I like my laptop to just be my laptop uh, and not be full of stuff. And I don't really know why. It's just always bothered me. I just want it to be sort of pristine. Maybe it's because I have some weird conception in my head that I might like sell it one day. Uh, but, but no. Um, you have a signal booster for the mic. Yes. So I have one of those... Um, it is called a cloud filter. Uh, it's the CL1 mic activator. Um, and it, it's just a magical box. It has, so it has like XLR on both sides. Um, and you plug the mic into one side and then you get XLR out the other side and you put it in your audio interface and suddenly your audio is louder and better. Um, it doesn't take power, like it pulls power from the XLR. I, I've been very, very happy with it. Um, I did not DYI the, the NAS. Um, I bought a Synergy one. I just, it's just not worth my time. I figured out to, to run it myself and manage it myself. Mm. And then my NAS, um, auto syncs to, um, uh, to Backblaze B2. So I have an online copy. I basically, the, the idea here, right, is that I have, um, I have two copies locally. One is on my computer. One is, or one is on a, a disc, like a spinning disc on my computer. One of them is the NAS. And then I have a third, which is a remote copy, which is the, the one that's in Backblaze B2. Uh, I don't have an Ikea chair. I, I did for many years. I had the Ikea Marcus chair that I was pretty happy with. Um, but I do have an Ikea desk. Like this desk is Ikea and it's a, it's a sit stand desk. It's like one of the cheapest you can get. Like the, the size is not the cheapest one, but it's like the Ikea standing desk is much cheaper than basically everything else. And it works okay. I, I do miss the ability to have preset heights. That's a little annoying, but other than that, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, is your mic a dynamic mic? Uh, so it is a dynamic mic. The, the Procaster is, yeah. And yes, I have played Valorant. That's actually one of the reasons why I got the uh, the mouse. Uh, the map is in Portugal. Yes, it is the Iberian Peninsula. This is one of the few pictures that I actually took with me from the US, like the frame as well, because like the picture you could take out and roll up, but the frame is like a bunch of old barn wood that's like knocked together and it looks super cool. Um, Backless B2 is very cheap. Like their, their price for storage is, is very, very cheap. Uh, my headphones are, it's the Hi-Fi Man Sundara, these ones. Um, I've been very happy with those. They're, um, um, they're open ear. So they're not really good if you're in like a, a, 
an environment where there's a lot of noise because they basically don't block any sound from the outside, but that makes them a lot more comfortable to wear for longer periods of time. Uh, and the, the sound quality is really good. They're like more of an investment, like they're not cheap headphones, um, but they've lasted me for quite some time and I'm, I'm very happy with them. My mug is huge. Yeah, this is actually, um, I complained that I, after moving to Norway, that I couldn't find a big mug. Uh, and so my work bought me a giant mug. It's like the size of my head and it's fantastic. And it, it also says size matters on it. Mm. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let's then do a little bit of a switch over to software maybe. Um, oh yeah, but technically my camera is a Sony Alpha ZV-E10, if anyone is curious, with a 35 millimeter prime lens. Um, let me go here and switch over to this. So before I start diving into the software, um, all of my configuration files are on GitHub. So it's on github.com slash John who slash configs. Um, they're not really documented. Uh, many of them are like kind of a mess. Like I've just built them up over many years. They're not really designed to be, you know, shared or, or designed to be readable, uh, but they work for me. Like these are the ones I actually use. Um, so if you find any of this useful and you're like curious how I do it, then you can go there and look. Um, obviously, the um, the first thing that people notice generally when they watch the streams is why are your tabs on the bottom? Um, this is something that comes up. Like it, I think it's a comment on like half my videos is how are the tabs on the bottom? Um, well, so I'm running Firefox Developer Edition. Um, why Developer Edition? You know, I don't have a great answer to that. Like I used it back in the day because the non developer like there were things in the developer edition I wanted. And then I've just sort of defaulted to that now. Like I, I don't have a great reason for why to use that instead of the, the standard Firefox edition at this point, but you know, develop, I'm a developer, developer edition seems fine. Um, and then I have custom user Chrome's enabled, um, which is just a, a setting it was like a little bit of a deep hidden setting, but it is a setting in Firefox that allows you to essentially write CSS in order to style your browser UI. Um, and so you can see this here under, oh, it's under like GUI, Mozilla, Firefox, Chrome, user Chrome. And writing one of these is a huge pain. And every now and again, Firefox just breaks them. Uh, so it's not always fun to, to try to keep something like this, but it does work. Like it basically restyles, it uses like, um, uh, ordering for these uh, components in the UI to basically force the the browser render to swap them so that the the URL bar comes at the bottom and then it has to do a bunch of things so that like pop-ups go up instead of down right because if they're at the top then the pop-up would drop down and there's still some things I haven't figured out like if I start typing here then notice that this like the the recommendations list goes from the bottom up but if I write for example like github, then in order to go up this list, I have to press the down arrow because the key mapping, I can't change with CSS. And it's really stupid. I can change the ordering of them. And I do want the first suggestion to be closest to the URL bar, but I can't change the keyboard mapping. So the keyboard mappings are upside down. Um, so it's it's a little annoying, but, it, uh, but, it, but the reason I do it is because I've found that like, the top of my screen is very far away from where I normally keep my vision, right? Like my terminal is very often and like near the bottom is where things happen. Um, same thing if I look at code, I look sort of in the roughly the center of the screen. Um, near the top is like where my webcam is, is where the lights are. And so I don't like looking up there is kind of annoying. Um, and so therefore I instead keep use the bottom and I've been pretty happy with that. It, it originally stems from when I used to keep my monitor the other way around. So I would have my monitor be um, vertical instead of horizontal um, so that it was easier to read like research papers, for example, websites work a lot better that way. Um, code is nicer that way. Arguably I should just do it again, but it's, um, it's pretty annoying for streaming, which is one of the reasons I've stopped doing it. Uh, but there, the top of the screen is very far up. So you really, really want the tabs to be at the bottom. Um, Let's see. Um, 
Can you make a PR to Firefox to anyone? Can you use this to check back in the settings? Um, there used to be a setting for this and then it got removed. So I don't, I think they're actually looking to standardize. They're trying to get rid of uh, user Chrome CSS entirely, but luckily that one's living on for now. Um, okay. Yeah, at work, I also have my tabs on the left. Uh, tabs on the left is pretty nice. Like I use a uh, tree style tabs at work to, to basically get that full tree view. Um, I find that I don't really need that at home quite as much. Um, and so the the sort of horizontal view of uh, of the tabs works pretty well for me here. And, and again, like for streams, it often tends to be uh, decently nice to, and it forces me to like actually clear out my tabs every now and again, which I do not do on my work computer or on my phone. Um, and then the the next question that's sort of the, the fundamental one is, okay, um, what distro are you running? I'm running Arch Linux. I've run Arch Linux for many, many years. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons why I like Arch. One of them is that things are generally pretty up to date. Um, and that's nice. And I haven't really found it to break things for me very often. Like one of the downsides, right, of running sort of bleeding edge software is that, oh, it breaks all the time. And I just haven't found that to be the case for Arch. Um, the second one is that there's a huge repository of uh, packages that just kind of work out of the box, um, whether that's directly from the, the main repositories or from the AUR, from the user repository. Like basically everything has an Arch package these days. Um, and third, if there isn't an Arch package, it's pretty easy to write them yourselves. So like these bash scripts are pretty straightforward to write and they are bash scripts. It's a, it's a little bit nicer than just standard bash, but it's pretty close. Um, as opposed to something like Nix, where you need to like actually learn the Nix language. Um, this is just, you write some bash files that run like dot slash configure and make, and then it kind of works. Um, so that's really nice. Um, okay. Oh yeah, and the Arch Wiki is also very, very good. It's arguably one of the best Linux wikis um, for you know documenting how things work, why they work this way, what your options are. Um, I know a lot of other um, distros end up linking to the Arch Wiki because it it has so many people. Okay, um, and then for my that's sort of the main thing I think for the. Browser for browser extensions, um, I have a couple. But the main ones that I use are one password for password management. Um, I use uBlock Origin for blocking things. Um, I used to use the advanced mode where you have like basically the matrix functionality of for each domain and each subdomain which resources are permitted. Um, but it it's gotten so tedious now that like lots of websites just require me to spend like. 30 minutes to an hour to get them to work. And then it's particularly annoying if you try to like check out an online store and you get to like step one and then, you know, filling out your credit card details doesn't work because you need to approve this thing. And then you go to next and that works fine. And then for the next screen, some other JavaScript thing didn't work. And so you need to allow it and then refresh the page, which takes you back to the start of checkout. And then you need to do this like really, really start to finish process over and over again. And I just got sick of it. Uh, and it sucks. I, I wish I could just have a thing that kept me secure by default, but but alas. Um, and then I use uh, Dr. Go. I don't know whether there's a great reason to use the plugin, um, but you know, I've, I installed it one day and I haven't really had problems with it. And I like the things are getting blocked, um, but I don't know that there's a great reason. It might, it might uh, deserve deletion at some point now. Um, Firefox multi-account containers. I'm not using too much on my desktop anymore. Um, the Pinterest save button, yeah, that's fine. And then I have this better jump to tab. This is actually an extension I wrote myself and it is uh, very straightforward actually. The only thing it does is, you know, normally in Firefox, you press like control and a number, then it takes you to that tab. So control one takes you to first, three, uh, two takes you to the second, control three, etc. cetera. Um, but I've mapped control nine, instead of being the ninth tab, it is the rightmost tab. Um, and that it's so useful. It's much, much rather what I would do for Control 9 than go to the ninth tab. Um, AUR seems so unsafe. The, the AUR is unsafe compared to the, the package repositories, but at the same time, you can just open the package builds. Like I do this for most of the things I install uh, from, the, from the AUR. Um, and 
I actually read through them because they're pretty straightforward to read. There's not usually that much in them. Um, and uh, depending on the AUR packager or, or installer tool you use, I use one called AUR Man. Um, and it actually, when a, an AUR package gets updated, it shows you the git diff of the package build. So assuming you reviewed the previous one, you like hit a key and then it shows you here are the things that changed in this file. And usually it's just like the version number. Um, and then it's still using like a, you know, the, the same GitHub URL to fetch the actual source. And at that point, like, okay, yeah, it's fine. Um, and so it's, it's pretty easy to, to stay secure up to date there that I've been happy with. Um, um, I have heard of Vimium and, you know, to, to get Vim bindings in the browser. My experience using that, that, that was many years ago now, was that it was it just did not work very well on a lot of websites, um, especially things with like particularly dynamic content. I just found that I ended up going to the to the mouse way more often than I would have liked uh, for things like hover, um, like too many things rely on hovering. Um, scrolling as well like you can like it just it just it just wasn't quite the same like for example if i'm reading an article it's nice to be able to scroll as i read and you can you can do that with stepwise scroll which is what you get with vim too but it's not quite as nice um so so i just uh i i think i found that the an, the annoyance of it was greater than the value i got out of it that might change like it might be that if i try it again it would be worthwhile but but no um I do not use a VPN because I don't really think they carry that much value. Um, in general, VPNs are, it's just, you're trusting someone else with all of your connectivity information. Um, and it's not clear to me that trusting all my data traffic to a given VPN provider is better than providing it to my current ISP. Um, in the US, it might be different because ISPs are pretty bad. Um, in Europe, much less so. Uh, I have more control too over my ISP. Like there's subject to local regulations here. Whereas if I sent everything through a VPN to like, uh, you know, controlled by some US entity, then I, I have a different, um, uh, my, my ability to have insight into and rules enforced on those connections are, are different. Um, Firefox does the rightmost tab already. Really? Has this changed? It did not used to be this way. Uh, manage extension. Disable. Well, now it's not doing anything. Oh, right, because it's supposed to be alt instead. Oh, yeah, how about that? Nice. Why is it alt, though? I want it to be control. Because alt I'm using for my window manager. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That's good to know. Um, Vimium has gotten better, but it still doesn't work everywhere. That makes sense. Um, NixOS package or Nix packages are a little bit better audited. That's true, but they're also a pain to read because you need to use Nixlang. Um, that's not to say that I dislike Nix. It's just I, I kind of like Bash. Um, uh, I don't really have a need to use a different browser. I'm very happy with Firefox. I use Firefox Sync for everything as well. I'm, I'm, it works pretty well for me. I haven't really had any problems. Um, do, 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 do. Right, so Windows Manager. Um, I'm using... So I switched from X11 to uh, to uh, Wayland when I started um, when I basically built this computer and, and moved. Um, my experience with Wayland so far has been that it's mostly fine. Um, I I'm using the Hyperland window manager and it's okay. I don't know that I'm fully sold. I don't like you can rebind all the keys, but the way you write key bindings are a little bit weird. Um, in Wayland 2, the, the window manager does a lot more. It's sort of a desktop manager more so than a window manager. It controls things like, um, you know, screen capture and stuff as well. Um, and that means that one program has to do a lot of things right. And I find that Hyperland does like most of the things okay, but I also haven't found any better alternatives. Like I think it's the 
the decentest alternative at the moment. Um, like, I don't actually want any animations, for example. One of the things that Hyperland gives you out of the box is, like, everything is very, like, smooth and animated and stuff. And I want none of that. I want to turn all of those things off um, because I like things to be extremely snappy without animation. Um, and so one of the sort of main selling points is not really a selling point for me. Um, it's also one where I can't really contribute to it very nicely because it's not in a language that I... Like, it's written in C++, um, which is fine. It's just not a language that I'm fluent enough in that I'm going to be contributing to it, um, which makes me a little sad. I, I like working with a window manager where I can make some changes. Um, but my understanding is that there's no very serious Wayland, uh, Rust-based Wayland window manager these days. Um, not using Sway, no. Um... Um, I was actually not coming from i3. So on X11, I used Xmonad for a long time. Um, and then after using Xmonad, I was using um, uh, BSPVM. So the binary space partitioning VM, which I actually liked a lot. Um, I was very happy with that one. And I haven't quite found the ability to like replicate that kind of setup here like in terms of how windows tile if i open multiple of them it feels a little bit more arbitrary in hyperland i can i can probably like tweak it to be more similar um but it wasn't quite as immediately obvious to me how to do that um uh i don't think xmonad works on wayland Um, and then I'll show you here too. So if I now go back out to here, so now you actually see my full screen. Uh, generally when I stream, I only share the part of my screen that's set up here. And this is one thing that is a little bit nice with Hyperlin is that I can set a, basically a, a padding of my where windows get placed. So you'll see if I open another window now, it still opens within the borders of what I normally share. And that's because I've basically set the margins of the desktop to be this. And then I've set the chat window to be a, um, uh, a floating window with a fixed position. And you'll see that if I switch virtual desktops, the chat still stays in the same place because it's both, it's basically a pinned window that um, is pinned across workspaces in the same location. Um, so I found that that, that does help with the streaming setup quite a lot. Um, you'll see I have a bar at the bottom here. Uh, that one is a uh, yam bar. Um, and writing the config for that took me a little while to get it nice, including things like um, nice Wi-Fi information about like showing weather icons for how well connected you are. Um, I'm pretty happy with that one. The main thing that was actually annoying was to get the... Um, uh, virtual desktop listing in here from Hyperlin because it's not no immediately a good way to do that. I wrote this little tool that um, connects to Hyperlin over the socket protocol and extracts the current list of virtual desktops, their names, their order, uh, and whether they have Windows on them. Uh, and so that's this Yambar Hyperlin wuzz. Uh, and I think that one's on here. Yeah, it's just a Rust project. It's not super complicated, um, but it just it just queries Wayland and then outputs it in a, uh, in a format like it uses the Hyperland crate to talk to Hyperland, and then it outputs it in the format that you can feed into um, a Yambar script so that I get it listed at the bottom. Um, Uh, great. Um, and then apart from that, you know, I have, um, uh, for the, the numpad that I showed you, um, you'll see here that in my Hyperland config, I have a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, some of it is default stuff. Some of it is not. Um, but one of the things you'll see down here is, uh, these key bindings. No, not those key bindings, these key bindings. Uh, which execute this OBS do script. So this is my way to control OBS uh, with global shortcuts because in um, uh, in Wayland, you don't really have global shortcuts. That's not really a thing. 
there's no protocol for them. So OBS can't register global shortcuts anywhere. So instead you program your window manager to like send commands um, when things are pressed. And in my case, um, I've mapped the numpad keys here to execute this OBS do script, which is a, also a small Rust program that just uses the OBS WebSocket control protocol to do things like set the scene, toggle mute, toggle stream, toggle record. Um, and so that, that's how I bridge between them. So if I press, you know, one of the numpad keys, it really just sends a message over the OBS WebSocket and then OBS takes the, the corresponding action. Um, and then for a launcher, um, I actually use, uh, D run, um, oh, sorry, Rofi. Um, so Rofi is this super, super straightforward launcher, uh, it's really like, you can see how bare bones it is. I don't think I even styled it. Um, and it's because my launcher is on my screen for all of, you know, 0.5 seconds. Uh, and I really just want to be able to like type something quickly in there. Uh, and it has, you know, fuzzy matching and it just works. Like I'm very happy with it. All I wanted to do is like, sh um, quick complete my applications and nothing else. And so I could configure it pretty easily to do that. So it's just a uh, Rofi plus D run. And then I'm very happy with that one. Um, specifically because it's so simple. Uh, and then for uh, notifications, I use uh, Dunst, uh, which doesn't get launched through here. Um, but Dunst give these like, you know, if I do uh, notify send, then you can customize those here. It appears in the top corner. Um, you can set them up basically however you want. You can style them with like CSS colors and stuff. Um, so again, you can see, I like these like very simple single purpose programs that I can make as minimal as possible. Um, and then I use Mutt or Neo Mutt technically for my email. Uh, my terminal here is Alacrity. Uh, I've used that for years. I'm very happy with it. It's also written in Rust, which is nice. Um, and as you can see at the bottom here, I have Tmux set up. Um, I don't actually persist my Tmux sessions. I just close them and open them. Uh, and that works okay for me. Um, it's rare that I end up having like lots of sessions that I want to keep open for very long periods of time. Um, and oh yeah. So for login, this is funny. I, um, I used to use SDDM as my, um, login prompt on Linux, like the thing that launches when your computer launches before that has you like type your password. Um, and I changed that recently into what, what I now do instead is, um, I don't run a, um, a greeter, like a graphical greeter. Instead, what I do is in my fish config, um, you'll see here. I check whether I'm on the first virtual console. And if I am, then I exit Hyperland. So I just get this, the like command line Linux login prompt. Um, and I type my username and password and the fish automatically launches my window manager. Um, if I'm on the first terminal, if I'm on any other terminal, then it does not. And I just get a standard fish shell. Uh, and this just works really nicely for me. It means that there's like, very little complexity in my startup process because it doesn't have to boot any GUI. It just drops me into a virtual console and then auto launches Hyperland when I log in. Uh, and yeah, I am intentionally still sharing full screen. Um, although I guess I don't really need to anymore. The, the one thing that you'll see from the bar down here is I don't actually have um, status bar icons, which makes me a little sad. Um, I would love to have like... Uh, you know, a little mail uh, icon. I wrote this tool called Buzz, which is in Rust, which is just a, puts a status bar icon that just shows you whether you have email or not, and then uses uh, notify send. So I get like dunce notifications for when I have email. Um, and I still haven't found a good status bar for Yambar. In fact, I don't know that it has one. Um, and so that's something I, I want, but haven't found yet. Um, all right, let's go back to this. Um, and then let's see. So that's window manager, desktop setup, browser. Um, uh, my shell is fish. So I don't use ZSH. I don't use bash. I use fish. I'm very happy with fish. I've used it since like the early days. Um, and it's just like, it just has everything out of the box. There's like no, 
it looks nice. It has auto completes. It has like argument completion. Um, I, I I'm very happy with it. It has a a uh, command line scripting capabilities that are similar to Bash, but have way fewer of the Bash isms. So like, if you want to set a variable, you do like set foo and then the name of the variable. Um, if you want to like, I don't know, RM something that's in a variable, you write this and it understands that it needs to quote them. It hands white space correctly. Uh, if you want to do like a loop over something, um, then you don't need all this like in, in Bash, you have to write like four, uh, um, you know, as an example, do uh, echo uh, I and then uh, done. And then the the terminator mm, end, done. Uh, and one of the things that's weird about bash is like the way that you terminate things depend on which operator you have. So like if you want an if, then you need to remember to like do this. And then it's like, you know, if F, and then you got to remember whether you should have single or double. You write it, got to write the semicolon and then then. And then if you don't have a new line, then you need a semicolon. And then you can, you know, echo foo. And then here you got to press FI because that's the way you end an if statement. Um, and this is just really annoying. And with fish, you don't have to do any of it. Like you do 4F in, you know, seek 110, echo, I, uh, echo F, end. And everything is terminated with end. So it's just like a more straightforward um, way to just like, you know, do at least simple shell scripting um, that I'm pretty happy with. And yeah, fish is being rewritten in, in Rust, which is nice. Um, do you still use your Philco keyboard? I have it, but I don't use it. I use this, um, the split kinesis keyboard now. Oh, I'm pretty happy with that one. Um, bashing on bash. I love bash for what it's worth. I think bash is a really fun thing to like dig your brain into, but it is also very frustrating. And sometimes, especially, so I actually found in the, when I end up writing a little bit of automation in the terminal, like, a for loop with some if for something that those are the times where I don't think very carefully about how I write the command. And yet those are the times when most often it comes back and bites me in some stupid way when I didn't handle white space splitting. Um, and then you know, end up like removing my entire home directory or something. Um, and so I actually appreciate not using bash specifically in interactive terminals a lot. When writing bash scripts, I, I'm much less worried about it because I know I have to be careful and I have an editor and everything. Um, but, but when I'm just writing it like this, it's not really worth it. Um, yeah, I use, um, for file finding, I use FD. Um, for searching files, I use ripgrep RG. Um, I've, I haven't used anything else for a long time. Like the last time I typed grep is a very long time ago. Uh, same thing with find. I just use FD these days. Um, I do use FCF, um, but not in the way you might think. So I don't actually use it in my terminal at all because the, the fussy finding in fish is good enough. Um, the place I use it is actually in, and we'll, we'll get to this in a second, um, is for my fish um, completion. No, for my NeoVim... Uh, file opener completion. Uh, not this one, but this one. Uh, no. Um, proximity. Where's my proximity sort? Here. Uh, this is going to be hard to read, but... Basically, this is the thing that gets called when I press control P in my terminal. Um, so control P is my hot button for open a file in the sort of local, like open a file nearby. Um, and what it does is it finds the, um, uh, it finds the nearest like git directory. No, actually it just looks down. It doesn't look up anymore. It used to, but it doesn't anymore. Um, it runs FD in order to find all of the files and it follows symlinks. Um, and then it passes those into proximity sort, which is this little tool I wrote, um, proximity sort, um, that just takes, um, it takes a list of files 
or file names, and it sorts them based on how far they are from a given argument. So the way I do this here is I pass it the current file, the path to the current file. So this means that if I go into, um, uh, let's not use that one. Let's use, um, let's use we were wondering maybe. So here, Let's say I'm opening, you know, uh, ask. So I'm in server slash source slash ask.rs. Um, if I now type E, then, you know, there are a bunch of files that have E in them, obviously. But the way that they're sorted using proximity sort is they're sorted by the distance from the current file that is open and then piped through FCF. So um, as a result, like FCF is what gives me um, a fuzzy search over this list. So when I type E, it's FCF that filters this list, but the entire list that's input to FCF is um, sorted by the distance from the current file, which is why it proposes another file under server source first um, before it's, and then it suggests something that's an infra, but it's in the root of infra. And then it suggests something in client source because that's even farther away from the current file. Um, and so this is a, this just turns out to be basically exactly the completion that I want, because usually if I'm working in a source file, chances are, if I want to open another file, I want a source file, not say a test file. Um, but I still can get to them if I want to. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, let's see. Do you use any planner apps like Notion? Um, I use, no, well, kind of. So I use Todoist as my to-do list, which I think is okay. Um, it's not great for, um, uh, forcibly reminding me of things. Like it just kind of passively shows me a list and I, I need it to like, ring my phone to tell me to do something. Um, and I, I wish it, I could configure it to be a little more aggressive. Um, for password manager, I use one password. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, okay, great. Um, I think that gets us to my editor. Sort of already kind of got there, but that's where we'll go next. Um, so I'm using NeoVim as my editor still. I'm still very happy with it. Um, arguably some of these plugins can go away now as well. I use, um, I use Plug as my sort of plugin manager for NeoVim, straightforward enough. Um, the main thing that I use are Lightline, which is this bar down here that shows me what file I'm in, the sort of, um, uh, language encoding it uses, where I am in the file, the mode I'm in, um, FCF for that control P bit that I mentioned previously, right? So the thing that gives me a uh, quick open of files. Um, I have a couple of languages added in here to get syntax and completion, uh, sorry, just to get syntax. Um, then I use LSP for getting um, actual completion. I'll show you that with Rust Analyzer in a second. I do use Rust Analyzer, not terribly surprising these days. Um, and then, um, I also use Vim router, which is the thing that will, um, basically CD to the root of the, like when you open a file, it'll try to find what the root of the Git directory that you're in is, uh, and then CD there. So all your commands run from there and all your paths are relative to there, um, which I've found to be pretty useful. Um, the, you'll see that the config file is mostly in Vim script. Um, and then there are a bunch of parts that are in Lua in the middle, um, especially things that have to do with LSP. Really, I should just rewrite this entire file to be in Lua because Vim script is a pain. Um, but that requires I actually sit down and like carefully think about how this um, file should be encoded in Lua. And I have not done that yet. Um, but you'll see that like the all the LSP parts are in Lua. Um, 
I have uh, most of the completion here is pretty standard. It's like mostly copy pasted from um, from the sort of LSP config bits. Um, I do have path completion turned on because I find that really handy to be able to do things like, you know, this and get paths on my system completed. Um, I don't like snippets, so I've done everything I can to turn them off. Uh, for Rust Analyzer, um, I have a couple of settings, but nothing that's too interesting. Uh, I've enabled grouping of imports um, because... Actually, I don't want this to be enabled. I want this to be different. What I actually, the setting I actually want, which I think is unstable still, is just use a single chunk of use of imports. I don't actually want them to be um, split up in any way. Um, I want them to be sorted, but I don't want white space in between groups of uses. Um, uh, apart from that, this is standard to move between diagnostics. This is all basically copy pasted from the LSP config. There are a couple of things that I've renamed. Like I've, this is like RN in the default config, but I didn't really care for that. This is like a W, a C or something. So the, the things I use most, I've, I've shortened the distance to. Um, uh, I've turned off semantic tokens because I hate them. I don't want tree sitter. I don't want all my variables to get colors. Um, it, it leads to too many colors in my editor and it makes me sad. So I've turned those off. Um, and then I have uh, signatures turned on that are very limited. So you'll, you'll see this if I open up, um, uh, let's do cordiality. No, cordiality. Um, so if I go to discord hook here, for example, I go down to something here um, and press, uh, so shift K is the, the hover key uh, in Vim. So you can use this to basically emulate, you, you tell the LSP, hey, what would you show me if I hovered over this thing? Uh, and so in this case, this is what it shows me. So it does not show me, for example, um, uh, like it, it tries to keep this fairly minimal. Uh, it does show me like the, the text or the, the main bits of the documentation for a method. Uh, same for a type. And you see, I have, you know, go to definition and all the standard things just kind of work. Um, any particular reason for not migrating to Lua? It's literally just I haven't had the time. I really should. The, there's very little reason to use Vim script anymore. But it would mean I need to find the Lua equivalents for everything that I do, which is sometimes pretty annoying. Um, I've not tried Helix. I have no, I felt no need to try any other editor. Like I'm very, very happy with NeoVim and my current LSP setting um, or LSP setup rather. Um, I don't really know why I would use a different editor. Um, Consider moving to the lazy NeoVim plugin manager. It doesn't really matter to me what plugin manager I use. Like it just kind of, like it's just cloning a Git repo into my configs. Like it's not really that interesting, really. Um, oh, there's a way to transpile Vim script to Lua. That's neat. Uh, this has got to be TJ, right? Dave, Dave, uh, Vim nine JIT. Oh, I was hoping I could. Uh... Nice. That's pretty neat. Maybe I'll do that. Um... How do you balance fixing an annoyance in your dot files with staying on task? Um, it's a little bit of a mix. Usually I go fix them because they end up frustrating me more so than they... Uh that they end up causing enough frustration that it's worth fixing. But otherwise, I mean, I don't need to write them down because they're going to frustrate me every single time. Um, okay. What else do we have further down here? Anything that's worth sharing? A lot of this is just like old configuration that I set once and have sort of forgotten, right? So this is configuration of my light line down here. Um, I don't think that's particularly interesting. This stuff around AG, I don't use AG anymore, so this one isn't really relevant. I've turned off all folding because I don't like folding. Um, Control-P to open files. I also have um, same thing as I have Control-P to open files. I also have um, leader semicolon to do an FCF search over my uh, file history, over the sort of open buffers rather. Um, that works pretty well. Uh, I don't think these even do anything anymore, honestly. Um, none of this is that interesting. 
Uh, permanent undo is very nice. Configure it if you haven't already. Just be aware that this folder then has sensitive information in it. You might want to remove it every now and again. Um, incremental search is nice. So this is the thing that gives me like, you know, actual search and globally highlighting all the matches. Same thing for replacements. So if I do like, um, it, high, it live highlights replacements that I do. Um, magic search, that's fine. None of this is particularly interesting. Color columns at 80, so that's this line over here. Um, I've disabled um, all my arrow keys, which down here. So arrow keys don't work in Vim for me. I don't use them anyway, but initially this was useful. And then I have control J and control K both mapped to escape. Um, because they're on my home row. So they're faster to get to than have to get to the top left. Um, I have caps lock map to control. So control keyboards are, are very quick for me to type. Um, so control J and control K are, are sort of home row things. Um, I used to use a uh, auto jump as my sort of s way to get around things quickly, but I found that it like, it didn't really speed me up that much. Be and it's mostly because, um, the the fish completion like you know i type cd and it takes me the place i wanted to go and i type control f and then i'm there um so i just haven't really needed it tabs or spaces i used to be very much a, a tabs person um and then uh and in particular i like um eight care eight space tabs because it discourages very deep indentation um but with Rust, that gets really annoying because you want to be able to wrap and stylistically indent. Um, like you want things like, you know, um, chained dot calls. You actually want to line up and you want them to, um, you don't want them indented by like eight spaces. And so that means you need a mix of space and tabs and mixes of spaces and tabs are awful to deal with. Um, and so as a result now, I basically have reverted to using tabs and it makes me sad, but... Like I like the ability, the idea that you can configure the width of your indentation, but in practice, it doesn't really work when you have to mix and match them anyway. Um, and also I just want Rust format to do the thing for me. Um, you might not need ink search in Neovim. Again, my, my, um, my configuration here has been left with me for like many years. So a lot of these things are probably not needed in Neovim at all. Um, how do you get relative number? Oh, I mean, this is just relative uh, line numbering, which is an absolutely fantastic thing to have in um, in Vim. Because like now, you know, let's say I wanted to delete all of these lines, right? If I'm up here, I can see that that's 10 lines. So I can 10 DD and then they go away. Um, I have not used the Windows subsystem for Linux, and I have no interest in using it. I don't want to be, ever be on Windows ever again. Um, how do you build and run Rust code in, in Neovim? I don't. I open Tmux, and then I have a separate terminal that I use. So I just tab between them in Tmux. There's no reason for me to really do anything else. And like Cargo T will run my tests. I, I know that some people then start complaining to me like, oh, but like, you know, one, what if you are, uh, what if you want to run like this test or mm, like, what if you specifically want to run the foo test? And I go, well, then I do cargo T foo. Like I don't, it's just not having a keyboard shortcut to run this and then having it pop up in like a, in a terminal that's inside my editor. It's just not worth it to me. Well, one of the big problems is it means that I have to share the screen estate. Um, so the output of running the test is then going to be in like some window that is inside of the editor, which means a worse, uh, terminal. And it also means some of that information is either going to be reinterpreted by the editor in order to display it nicely. Um, or it's going to be like cropped because that output window is smaller than my editor. And so I would rather just get the full output raw directly from Rusty. Um, so I, I, you don't use any integration for, um, running code. Um, I have not used bacon for compile errors and I don't know what that means. Um, do you ever reach for a debugger when understanding tricky bugs in Rust? I do, but it's pretty rare. Um, I, I'm to a large extent like a, a print debugger. Um, I find that that works pretty well most of the time. Um, 
Not always. Like every now and again, especially if it's something like a deadlock or a crash, like an actual like I did something bad and this is segmentation fault. Um, for those things, I pull out a debugger. But for just like everyday debugging, um, print line works fine for me. Um, do you use Harpoon? I don't know what Harpoon is, so no. Um, nice. Um, let's see if there's anything left in the Vim config that matters. Uh, oh yeah, um, double leader for me. So in my case, leader is space. So double leader switches back and forth between the two most recent buffers, um, which is very handy if you're like just copy pasting something between two files or, or uh, referencing the two files. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yeah, invlist. So I am um, leader comma will hide and show things like trailing white space uh, or like whether something is tab indented or not. Um, it's this is a handy way to just quickly show hidden characters. Um, oh yeah, these are nice too. So I make sure that I don't accidentally overwrite backup files. Um, Jumping back to the last place you were when you open a file, but none of this is particularly interesting. Um, apart from that, you know, I have I use Rust up like everyone else. I use Rust Analyzer installed through uh, the Arch package because it gets updated frequently enough that I don't actually really need to have it downloaded locally. That works okay. I generally build on beta, so my default Rust setup. So I have like Rust up default beta. Um, just because I like testing beta releases of Rust. Um, it's pretty rare that I use Nightly these days. Um, apart from that, I think... I'm trying to think if there's anything else that like is software or hardware I use that's worth mentioning. Um, Hmm, it's a good question. Uh, are there, is there anything that people are curious about in my workflow? Sort of having watched the the videos that I have uh, so far, like anything where you're like, how does that work? Or what do you use for this? Or how do you get that thing to do this thing? Um, have you tried Nix? I've still not tried Nix. I, have, I just haven't had a use for it, which is not... Like I just, I haven't had a use for it and also have not, not had the, the spare time to go investigate it on my own. Um, if I had one of those two, then I would do it. Um, I've not really used the one password command line tool, no. Um, hasn't really been needed. How do you handle per project dependencies? Can you say more about that? Like, I don't know what you mean. Uh, have you ever had anything explode because of using the Rust beta channel? No. No, I, uh, beta has just worked very well for me, actually. I haven't had any issues with it. What's your Tmux team? Um, my theme is, and my theme everywhere is um, Groovebox uh, Dark Hard. It's a retro groove color scheme. So it's uh, specifically the it's the hard version of dark mode. So it's less gray, more black. Um, and I've been pretty happy with that. I'm using um, base 16. Uh, so base 16 is this project. Uh, that's unhelpful uh, themes. Um, base 16 is this effort to, it's like a framework for taking, like you can write um, the way that colors are encoded in different programs as templates. And then you write, colors as variable sets for those templates. And so that way you can generate, like for all of the different programs, you can generate themes for all of the known themes. Um, and so using that, I basically generate um, Groovebox Star Card theme files for everything. Um, and so I use that for NeoVim, I use it for Alacrity, I use it for Tmux, I use it for Mutt, um, I use it for... Uh, my virtual console, uh, I use it for Dunst. 
just everywhere that it's it's so nice to be able to just like not have to um not have to like try to find a theme for each one i can just sort of say i want this theme generated for all my applications um and, oh yeah my font is um font am i using these days noto sans mono um, I've used that for a while too, and I've also been pretty happy with this font. I think it looks pretty nice. It also looks nice both uh, small and large, uh, which is a handy combination. Um, how did your work laptop setup differ from your home setup? I mean, my work laptop is very different, right? Because it's it's Mac OS, so I have much less control over the setups. I use like rectangle for uh, window management. Um, but that's really the main customization I have there. My work setup is is very uncustomized, especially when it comes to like window manager applications uh, type things. My um, editor setup there is the same. So I'm using the same configs for like using NeoVim, the same set of plugins, like, or it's like slightly reduced, but like basically the same set of plugins. Um, Tmux, Alacrity. So, so the, the editor environment is, is more or less the same. Um, is bait, is the beta pipeline updates due to go out on stable? How's it different from unstable? Uh, do you mean, how's it different from nightly? So beta is the thing that will become the next stable release. Um, it does not give you access to nightly feature or unstable features like nightly does. So it's basically like you're pre-testing the next stable. Um, how do you handle note taking? Um, I, so it depends on what you mean by note taking for like notes to myself that are like about things I like ideas I have or things I want to do. I use obsidian, um, for notes, like in a lecture, I basically don't, but when I do, I write markdown files. Um, Uh, what's your quick way to check where the program is spending the most time, Inferno or a combination of tools? Yeah, I, I usually just use perf, um, unless perf specifically ends up not giving me the right results. Um, so like a quick perf record and then piping it into Inferno, and that gives me a, a pretty quick overview. Uh, how do you provision your OS? Do you have any automation in place? No, I actually specifically do not have automation in place. Um, I don't automate my um, computer setup. So I, I have my configs all checked in, but apart from that, every time I set up a new computer, every time, it doesn't happen that often, but when I set up a new computer, um, I redo all the setup from scratch. And I do that on purpose because the idea being um, the choices that I made the last time I set up a computer may no longer be right. They may be like, if I had automation, I would get exactly the same setup, but it could be that like some of those programs are no longer maintained. Some of them are no longer the optimal choice. Um, and so it's a, it's sort of an opportunity for me to revisit those choices. Uh, so I actually enjoy the fact that I don't have automation for setting things back up. Um, have you done Golang these days? No, I'm, I basically haven't programmed in Go for a very long time now. Like since, um, my first year of the PhD. It's been a long time. It's almost been 10 years now since I did go, which is nuts. Yeah, I started my PhD in 2014. So it's like 10 years ago. Um, do you use popular Rust core utils alternatives like RipGrep and FD? Yes, we've already discussed that. Um, do you use an RSS feed reader? No, I don't. Although I am increasingly getting back onto the sort of blog train like i'm getting pretty annoyed with like twitter it doesn't really work as a way to follow people and to have meaningful conversations anymore M mastodon is okay but i don't really like it and i can't quite put my finger on why uh linkedin is a closed ecosystem uh discord is okay for real-time conversation but it's not really where you follow people for like updates um and so i'm i'm actually increasingly moving back into the sort of um uh i'm increasingly moving back into like using rss feed readers and having an aggregated feed that i read the biggest problem i have at the moment is my reading list is so long that i have no hope of catching up on it unless i like 
you know, dedicate a few months to just catching up. Um, so I might have to declare bankruptcy at some point and just start from scratch. Uh, do you ever use Miri in your testing workflow? Yeah, I use Miri quite a lot. Um, a lot of my, the CI actually that I use for a lot of projects uh, runs Miri by default, at least for anything that has unsafe in it. Uh, have you looked at the flavors CLI? I have not. And what was, someone said NeoVim like bacon? What was bacon? This one, uh, I'll have that open for later. Uh, Flavors base 16. Manager. I don't want a manager. Um, let's see. Uh, when you use a debugger, what do you use? Do you use some kind of NeoVim integration? Do you just use GDB? I actually don't use GDB either. I use, well, every now and again I do, but I often use LLDB these days. Um, it's a little nicer to interface with, um, but yeah, I just I just spin up LDB. I don't use the the actual editor integration. Uh, do you ever use VMs or containers? No, basically never. Um, it's pretty rare that I need a a container for anything, even less a VM. Um, what email service do you use? I use Fastmail. I don't want to use Gmail because A, I want to pay for my email. B, I don't want Google to have all of my email. Um, and C, I like something that actually interoperates with standards and Google or Gmail do that because they're forced to and Fastmail does it by choice. Um, I've used Fastmail for a long time. I really like it. Um, yeah, fresh installs are fun, right? Like it's fun to start from scratch and sort of re-explore and rediscover. Uh, project layout for large Rust projects. I don't think I'm going to go into now because I'm, I'm trying to sort of focus on things that are setup based. Um, you play games on PC on console. I'll, I'll call that setup based. Uh, uh, I mostly play on console these days on the PS5. Um, although I do have like a Windows drive in my computer that every now and again I'll, I'll boot into for like, uh, for Valorant or for Civilization or, you know, any of the the games that are uh, way better on PC. Um, how do you manage switching to Mac OS? Don't you get annoyed with the missing window management? Yeah, I, I hate working on Mac OS, but in, a, in the work context, it's not impossible to use Linux, but it's certainly much better supported to run Windows or Mac OS. And between the two of them, there's no doubt that I would rather use Mac OS. Um, plugins used in Obsidian, just core plugins. I do have a Blue Sky account, but I don't really use it. Um, where do you read RSS? Um, there's a tool called The Old Reader, which is basically, it's a website that is essentially a uh, someone basically tried to replicate Google Reader uh, and then they've continued to develop it and hence the name, The Old Reader. Um, and I used that for a long time and then I haven't really used it for ages now, but I, that's probably the one I would start with coming back to it. Uh, do you use bat over cat? Usually not. I like bat syntax highlighting, but cat is like built into my fingers and it's very rare that the syntax highlighting actually makes a difference for the things that I end up catting. Um, will you just give Rust Rover a try? No, I don't like IDs. I like to have like my editor be in a terminal. Uh, and so I don't want Rust Rover and I don't want an ID. Um, Civilization does work on Linux, but there are a bunch of games that don't. And so I just have basically Windows be my gaming partition, so to speak. Uh, same thing also because uh, on Windows, the AMD drivers are a little better. Um, I could use the binary drivers on Linux, but I don't really want to. Uh, I want to use the open source ones. I don't use Diren. No, I haven't really needed it much.
Uh, do you see any app for eBooks? Um, I have a Kindle that I use, but but beyond that, no, not really. That's uh, good enough for me. Have I tried Excalidraw? Yeah, Excalidraw is pretty nice. Um, I've used it for a couple of things, um, but but mostly like basic diagrams. I used it for. Uh, I wrote a blog post about Eisenhower vectors a little while back, where I used it amongst other things. Not analyzing things with Ghidra, um, although it is one of those things that looks like fun to do one day. Okay, I think, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that is worth covering um, of software and hardware here. Uh, I mean, cats are essential hardware. I would consider them essential hardware. Um, But other than that, is there like software I use regularly that's worth mentioning here? I don't think so. Uh, no, no, I think I'm, uh, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll leave it another 10 seconds or so if people think of Last minute questions, again, about setup. So like, there's all, th this is not really a general purpose Q&A stream. Uh, although, you know, I, I can do another one of those soon too. But it's specifically like about the hardware or software setup. Is there anything that you've like seen in videos so you're curious about how how worked or how I solve a particular problem when it comes to software or hardware? Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. But otherwise, I think we're, we're getting to the end. Uh... Any gadgets? Um, yeah, I have a, I use like a, a Fitbit, it's like a charge HR. Um, and the main reason I use this one is actually because um, I want it to wake me when I'm in light sleep. It's like the only thing I use it for. I have like notifications disabled on it. I only have it for the, the smart wake up alarm and nothing else. Um, breast extensions, we already went over. Uh, do, 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 do. System D, Home D, no, because uh, that only really started to be a thing uh, after I did my last big setup. Um, so it's probably something I would do next time I do a setup, but not something at the moment. Uh, how do you keep your setup secure software-wise? Uh, I don't specifically run any security software. Oh, well, that's not quite true, but close enough. Um, how do you do Google Calendar thing for streams? I just have a shared Google Calendar. It's actually like, it's not, not anything fancy. Like it's literally just a shared Google Calendar. Um, I have thought about writing some automation for it, but because the streams are like not that frequent, it's not really something that um, uh, that's super required. Like the, the manual process is very fast. And so the automation would have to be very fast to build in order to actually make a, a positive difference. Uh, wake during light sleep works pretty well, I think, yeah. Uh, how do you navigate buffers in NeoVim? Just the alternate file buffer plus FCF or something else. Yeah, it's just um, the buffers plus FCF and then control piece of colon files uh, with the with a, a FD and proximity sort. Uh, Pipewire for sound. Yeah, I use Pipewire these days. Uh, keyboard layout is QWERTY. I'm not uh, I'm not cool enough to to use anything else. Um, did you have a strong reason to move to one password from pass? So I used pass for ages and I was pretty happy with pass. The biggest annoyance actually was not having a, I, I didn't feel like I had a solid and secure uh, story for um, keeping it in sync across devices, managing the keys and uh, backups and accessing it from my phone. You can do all of those things with pass, right? Like you can exchange them with, uh, with Git. Um, you, 
just keep your GPG keys secure, however, you know, hand wavy. Um, and uh, from your phone, I think there is like an Android tool that can integrate with Pass as well. Um, for backups, I mean, you you have it in Git, so you can, in theory, Git push it somewhere. And I did do that. Um, because they're encrypted files, it should be fine. But ultimately, it just felt very hacked together. And it was annoying enough, enough of the time that I was like, I'm just going to switch to something that is easier and that I don't spend as much time worrying about. And I've been very happy with that. Um, how do you deal with switching between command C and V and control C and V between Mac and Linux? Uh, it's so annoying. It is so annoying. Like one of the things that happens is also which key does, like if I do command V on Linux, it like Hyperlint will like switch a window to like, um, it's not even floating mode. It's like some other mode and it's not what I wanted. I just wanted to paste something. It's very frustrating. I've like accidentally closed my browser because I pressed the wrong command key. It's, it's very frustrating. Uh, I want them to all be the same, but Mac is not, Mac OS is not very happy about letting you control your shortcuts. Linux is, but there are a couple of standards and they're just kind of fundamentally incompatible and it's, it's super annoying. Um, Yeah, so one of the one of the reasons I moved away from Pass as well was that I don't use GPG keys for anything anymore. Um, like I, I don't currently have a valid one. I only have expired ones. Um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, there was a period of time where I was very like, you know, I got my GPG key signed by lots of people and it was very exciting. And I'm like, it's just not, it's not providing me with any actual value. So I stopped. All right. I think I'm going to call it there. Um, hopefully I've now covered all of the burning questions people had about my setup since like, I think the last time I did the stream about my setup was in like 2018. Um, so a lot of things have changed since then, but hopefully now it's all been covered and now I can wait another five years until I do the next one. <laughs> uh, and, oh, I guess I'll mention, yeah, I use a, I do use a YubiKey. I use one of the Fido keys. I'm not using the, the older Yubi keys anymore. So with that, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out and hopefully that was interesting and useful uh, and I'll, I'll see you all next time. <laughs>